I was speaking of the, of the uh, parallel between the Exodus events and the events in the Gospel and was saying that the life of Jesus is evidently being presented to us in the Gospels as a, uh, a progress of a spiritual Israel in the form of an individual. Now that means, of course, that in this, these terms of type and anti-type, the story of Israel in the Old Testament, which is a story of a society, is a type of the story of an individual in the New Testament, which is it's anti-type. And <clears throat> that leads to the form of metaphor in which the individual is being identified with the group. And <clears throat> I have previously suggested that there are two forms of, identi of identification. There is, in the first place, identity with, and that is the kind of identification that you get in the ordinary metaphor. If you look at Jacob's prophecy of the twelve tribes of Israel in the uh, second last chapter of Genesis, Genesis 49, you will find a series of metaphors of that, uh, of that type. The, this is that. That is, Joseph is a fruitful bough, Naphtali is a hind let loose, Issachar is a strong ass, and so on. Now those are metaphors, and in that form, th that this is that form where two things are said to be the same thing and yet remain different things, we have the ordinary poetic metaphor, which is, as I said earlier, not simply illogical but anti-logical because two things can never be the same thing and yet remain two things. And then there is also the identity as, which is the basis of all ordinary categorical thinking where you identify an individual by placing it within a class. If somebody who's just come in from Mars comes into my office and says, what's that brown, brown and green object outside your window? And I can say, that's a tree. I am identifying the individual object he's pointing mm -hmm. to with the class to which it belongs. That is, I'm identifying it as a tree. <clears throat> there is a third kind of metaphor which unites the anti-logical identity with and the categorical identity as. And that is the kind of metaphor that you have <clears throat> when you identify all the trees of Eden with the tree of life and all the cities of the world, either with Jerusalem or with Babylon. And it is that peculiarly powerful and subtle metaphor, which you get by identifying a thing as itself and also with its class, that the 
metaphor of kingship belongs to, and that is why kingship is one of the most pervasive of human, human institutions. The society that went furthest in identifying the entire society with and as the, the king was ancient Egypt. And if you look at, say, the Tutankhamun collection, um, you would say to yourself that it would be absolutely incredible that all that labor and expense went into the constructing of a tomb for a pharaoh. We'd never believe it without direct evidence. And yet when we understand how very pervasive the royal metaphors are in Egypt, the pharaoh is not only a king, he is an incarnate god. He is identical with the god Horus before his death and with the god Osiris after it. And uh, he, is the, <clears throat> he, is, he was called the shepherd of his people, and unlike the Hebrew practice, he was high priest as well as king. And so it is possible that the ordinary Egyptian found an identity for himself within the mystical body of Pharaoh, which of a kind that our mental processes simply cannot recapture. And there is something of that feeling in the typical king figure of the Old Testament, who is usually identified either with David or Solomon, and who is not spoken of as an incarnate God, but as somebody under a, the special protection of God and a special relationship to him. In the second psalm, for example, you have an imagery attached to the king, which is more common among the Semitic peoples of Western Asia, in Psalm 2, verse 7, I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And this, of course, is taken in a much more precise sense in, in Christianity, but in this context, the king is being regarded as chosen of God and therefore the son of God. He is strictly the adopted son of God, but the ceremony of adoption is symbolized by the physical term begetting. This day have I begotten thee. And so that gives the king a special connection with divinity on the one hand and with his people on the other because by the principles of metaphor, the king does not represent his people, he is the people in the form of a single body. If you can find what uh, that is, that is true of the of the uh, king as exemplifying his society in an individual form, and that is why the conception of line of David is so central in the messianic imagery of the Bible. Now we remember that the typical narrative structure in the Bible was of this U-shape, where in the Old Testament usually the society of Israel starts in a position of relative peace or prosperity, does something wrong or meets with uh, a hostile ruler, as it did in Egypt, plunges into 
a state of bondage or servitude from which it is delivered. Now, if the king is his people in the individual form, it follows that the legendary kings of glory, David and Solomon, don't exhaust the metaphorical imagery of a king. The king also is his people in their shame and humiliation. If you can find the little book of Lamentations in the Old Testament, which comes just after in the uh, King James Bible, just after the book of Jeremiah, This has to do with the sacking of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and the carrying away of the people of Israel into captivity. And we are told that the unlucky last king of Judah, whose name was Zedekiah, had his eyes put out by Nebuchadnezzar. In the fourth chapter, in the twentieth verse, the breath of our nostrils, the anointed of the Lord, was taken in their pits, of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the heathen. Now, that phrase, breath of our nostrils, I could hardly say more explicitly than it does that the king is not a representative of his people, but, is, is, but the king is, is his people in an individual form. Any question that far? Now, of course, Israel spent most of its time during the Old Testament period in being in a state of humiliation and foreign conquest, and consequently the king figure has a good deal of this kind of imagery attached to him. And with the, I'm speaking of the Semitic peoples of Western Asia who had somewhat similar attitudes to kingship, even when those kings were, were strong and successful, they would have to go through certain ritual ceremonies in which they turned into the opposite role. And we are told that in Babylon, at the time of the New Year festival, the king, such as Nebuchadnezzar, would go through a ceremony of ritual humiliation, his face slapped by the priest, that sort of thing, and that then his title would be renewed for another year. <clears throat> and Nebuchadnezzar was a strong and successful monarch, but if this ceremony were omitted, it might provoke the jealousy of his, of, of his uh, tutelary deity. So we're not surprised to find that rather similar imagery is sometimes attached to even to the uh, glorified kings. If we look, for example, at 2 Samuel 6, that describes not only an episode from the very successful and glorious reign of King David, but also the particular episode which from the biblical writer's point of view 
was the greatest moment in David's life. That was the moment at which the Ark of the Covenant, which had gone through the desert with the Israelites, was brought into Jerusalem because the greatest military feat of David's reign was the capture of Jerusalem and the making of that city the capital of Israel. In verse 17, And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place. Uh, you have to watch out for 17th century locutions in the King James Bible. Uh, what the text says is they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place. And his there is the genitive case of it. In other words, the word its did not exist in the English language when the King James translators were at work. Or if it did exist, it was only coming into being as a neologism which no respectable person like a biblical scholar would, would use. And that's why the translations have to twist all around corners sometimes to avoid the word its. Uh, as in Psalm 19, there is nothing hid from the heat thereof, instead of saying there's nothing hid from its heat. And here, his place means its place. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched. So David showed the importance of the, his sense of the importance of the occasion by, in the first place, holding a communal meal in verse 19. He gave to everybody in Israel a cake of bread and a piece of flesh and a flagon of wine, and also by dancing in front of the ark with all his might. And his wife, Michal, who was Saul's daughter, <coughs> sneered at him as having made an exhibition, exhibitionistic fool of himself in front of the servants. And David's answer is very interesting from the point of view that we're looking at now. He says in verse 22, And I will yet be more vile than thus, and will be base in mine own sight, and of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. So he is speaking of the necessity of his own humiliation, even in his own eyes, as a part of his royal responsibility. So you can understand from that how it was that David got to be the traditional author of the Psalms. Because in the Psalms, you get phrases like, I will praise the Lord. And the I there is the author of the hymn, who is also all the singers of the hymn. That is, the the individual and the group are not linked in any logical relationship at all. They are identified. And it makes the identification that much more vivid and, inten <coughs> and intense if the I who speaks as the author of the hymn with whom the singers are identified is in fact the king. And that certainly would account for the number of psalms that are associated with David and yet are confessional psalms which express a need for forgiveness or a need for deliverance or a need of rescue against the slanders of enemies and that kind of thing. All these are things which the king goes through as the individuality of his people. A 
okay? I think you find the metaphor used wherever you find royalty and the institution of kingship or the equivalent of royalty. That is, um, I remember seeing a movie about 40 years ago which had to do with, with a group of emigres from revolutionary Russia, and uh, they are arguing with a communist who is in the, in the revolutionary Russian government, and uh, one of them says, what the Tsar was is something that you could never begin to understand. He was Russia, and that is an example of the royal metaphor being used in its full weight. Uh, and uh, you find the same imagery, there are even hymns to Stalin in later, later Russia which apply the same imagery to him. And uh, because of course anything that can be applied in a religious context can also be applied in an antichrist context. And, uh, and the, uh, the only mark of any genuine distinction in Hitler was the seriousness with which he took his antichrist role and uh, identified himself as the individual who was Germany. <clears throat> so you can get it in like every other image, in either an apocalyptic context or in a demonic one, and you can get it also in any society which has accepted that view of royalty, kingship, leadership, dictatorship, or whatever it is, uh, whether it's explicitly religious or not. Um, well, of course, the theory of democracy is uh, is has has rather, uh, so far as it has a theory, is uh, is of a somewhat different kind, and the metaphor of kingship is one which can be very appealing in certain contexts and an extremely regressive and sinister one in certain other contexts. And so if Queen Elizabeth II were to, were to go by on Charles Street, you would all be rushing to the window, not because there is anything unusual in her appearance, but because she enables you to see yourselves as a group in the form of an individual. Uh, and there is a particular intensity or even a pathos uh, about a figure who has acquired that status purely by accident as a result of birth and hasn't any executive power. And that is the kingship metaphor as an attractive icon. But of course, there are many other contexts where the kingship metaphor is a very dangerous idol. And it's because of the dangers in it that, uh, that democracy has, has uh, replaced the ritual humiliation of the king with the annual election in which <laughs> According to the theory, if you get enough 
individual imbecilities added together, you get a collective wisdom. Well, I suggested that begotten is a metaphor used to express a, a kind of process of rebirth uh, which the king undergoes as a result of becoming the king and what is called even in the Old Testament the, Lord, the Lord's anointed. That is, he now moves into, he's been born again, so to speak, and in his, in his rebirth, in his status of being born again, he has been begotten by the God whose, whose son he now is. You think of it as a very strong expression because, again, you're not accustomed to thinking metaphorically. But, uh, sorry? Yes. Well, the, the, the word, this second psalm is one of the two psalms, the other, the other one is Psalm 110, which were ex of greatest importance to the New Testament writers in defining their conception of the royalty of Jesus. And they used the term begotten as to mean that the, that Christ is the Son of God who proceeds from the Father and is, uh, is, the only, is the only element or aspect of experience that is not a creature. That is, everything else has been created, but Christ was not created, he was begotten. That's, that's the Christian uh, reading of it. And uh, <clears throat> that is, of course, an even more intensive I identification than is, I think, intended in the, uh, in the second psalm. That we as a group identify ourselves with? Would it be, would it be one of those third types of metaphors that we as a group identify ourselves not with the queen but with the sea and the power? But with the. Uh, well, anything other than a person. Oh, I see. Other than a human being. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Oh yes, that's, uh, that. Uh, there can be uh, there can be other metaphors of individuality. Uh, the 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 person is the is the most uh, direct and the most intensive form of metaphor because a person is of the same category as the people. Whereas if you identify yourself with a flag or or with something which is really a metaphor for a person. You are using a secondary metaphor. That is, legally, there is such an entity as a crown, but if Joe Blow were to walk along Charles Street carrying the crown, it would not arouse more than a casual interest on your part. It's, it's the, uh, that, that's a secondary metaphor. The, uh, the primary metaphor is the one which is of the same category as ourselves. And this, of course, the identification of the king with his people in moments of humiliation 
the most eloquent passage of that kind anywhere in the Bible comes from the middle part of Isaiah, what is called a sec the second Isaiah, because Isaiah 40 to 55, because he is writing many centuries later than the Isaiah who appears at the beginning of the book and is and represents himself at any rate as writing during the Babylonian captivity. And the prophecies of this second Isaiah revolve around a conception that scholars call the suffering servant. And the pronouns suggest that he's talking about an individual person. Uh, if you look at chapter 53, for example, and the third verse, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. The, the distinction is quite clearly drawn between the he and the we. we. That is, the, the suffering servant is spoken of as an individual, and we represents the society that has rejected him, but the point is that even in the act of rejection, the individual is the identity of the society that has rejected him. Probably, yes. That is the, uh, uh, it, it goes back to the ritual described in Fraser's Golden Ball, whether it was actually a ritual at the very beginning of human society, or whether Fraser was writing a piece of science fiction. It doesn't, doesn't really matter which it was. But uh, in the original Fraser Wright, as he describes it, the, the central figure of the community is regarded as both divine and human. And because he is that, the tribe's success is bound up with him. And consequently, of course, you can't have an unsuccessful or humiliated God-man or the tribe would go to pieces. So when he shows signs of uh, Losing his, not exactly his marbles, but his, uh, but his, his dominance, uh, you put him to death, eat his body and drink his blood, and thereby he passes into the bodies of his worshippers and creates a single body out of them. And his successor is immediately appointed and is cheered up in this office by having his predecessor's blood smeared over him and so on. Um, however, as I say, I don't, I, I don't know to what extent that, uh, that is more than a reconstruction. The, uh, the, the basis behind it is this metaphorical identification of group and individual, society and leader or king or what, whatever, and the fact that the death or humiliation of the king figure is something in which we are, our own identity is drawn in.
So I, I may have uh, mentioned this earlier, I'm not sure, but in the Exodus Gospel parallel, the Joshua who conquers the promised land is the type of the Jesus whose name is the same, who uh, achieves the conquest over death and hell. And Joshua, in his conquest of Canaan, we are told that he fights against certain enemy kings, that when he catches them after winning the battle, he hangs them on trees and then buries them and rolls great stones against the tomb. Similarly, we are told that the successor of the glorious David who captured Jerusalem was the equally glorious Solomon who built the temple. But David also had a son called Absalom who rebelled against his father and who was in flying from David's army is caught traditionally by his hair in a tree and hung there until David's general came up and thrust darts into his side. And in telling the story of, of the Passion of Christ in the Gospels, the Gospel narrators needed the imagery of the defeated kings of Canaan and the defeated Absalom as much as they needed the opposing figures of Joshua the Conqueror and, and Solomon, the, <clears throat> the king of wisdom hailed by the wise men. Now this, this uh, process of the humiliation of the king at the bottom of this U curve is something that can be expressed symbolically in ritual because, <clears throat> as I remarked earlier, it would make for political instability if you went through with that Fraser Wright in its unadulterated form and, uh, and the, when man is required by a religious contract to give everything he most wants himself to God, uh, it's a natural tendency and in most contexts an extremely healthy tendency for man to say the hell with this and, and put in a substitute instead. And similarly, in the Mosaic law, there is a very clear conception of the people of Israel celebrating at their new year the same kind of ritual humiliation that, that Nebuchadnezzar would have gone through in Babylon, but it is not here associated with a royal figure. It is purely a matter of ritual and the sacrificial victims chosen for ritual. Now you remember that the suffering servant in Isaiah is described as, not as despised and rejected. That is, he is not simply a person who bears our griefs, but also a person driven out of the community. We esteemed him not. And, and I've already suggested, I think, the importance or the significance for Christianity of the, of the fact that, that Christ was the kind of prophet that no society could put up with. 
And so there are these two things, these two aspects of the passion of the victim. One is that of being the pure victim put to death. The other is that of being an exile sent out into a desert. If you can find the book of Leviticus and the 14th chapter, This is a ritual to be gone through, to be observed by the priest, if there is a suspected outbreak of leprosy. And towards the end of the chapter, we are told that the priest is to take two birds, And verse 50, he shall kill the one of the birds in an earthen vessel over running water. And the other bird, in verse 53, is to be let go out of the city into the opening fields. So you avert a plague of leprosy by choosing two sacrificial victims, of which one is to be killed, the other sprinkled with its blood, who is its successor, so to speak, is driven out or exiled, or at any rate, released and let go. And the underlying symbolism of this ritual becomes clearer a couple of chapters later in uh, chapter 16, where the ceremony for the Day of Atonement that, that corresponds to the New Year festival in Babylon when the king went through a, a rite of humiliation. This is the same rite for the people of Israel. And here again, there are sacrificial victims in the form of two goats. And Again, one of the goats is killed, and the other is to be driven away from the people and symbolically carrying all the sins of the community on his head into the wilderness. And the King James translators came up with one of the most ingenious and inspired mistranslations in history and said, this goat is to be sent as a scapegoat into the wilderness, and that has given us the English language an essential word. It is not what the text says. The text says that this goat is to be driven out to Azazel, who is the demon of the wilderness. The goat is sent to the devil, or more precisely to Azazel, the devil of the wilderness. And uh, <clears throat> obviously, this is a development of a rite in which the original goat would have been sent out to Azazel. There's a passage in Leviticus, another chapter further on, that indicates that. But this is the one prescribed in the Old Testament. And so this corresponds, again, to elements in the Passion where Jesus is both killed on the cross and immediately after descends to the kingdom of the devils. But there is another aspect of the same imagery. We are told that at the time of the Passion, there were, in fact, two prisoners, Jesus and a robber named Barabbas, whose name is quite interesting because it means son of the father. And 
Pilate says to the crowd, it's your custom to release a victim at the Passover feast, so you choose one of these. And they, they chose Barabbas to be released, but as I say, it's, it's symbolically clear that, that Jesus has both roles. Yes? Um, it would be, yes. Yes. I'm not sure, not having been to Jerusalem, I'm not just sure how far outside the city it actually was, but uh, the, uh, uh, certainly the, certainly the, uh, the rejection theme comes in also into the context of mockery, because a great deal is made of the fact that although Jesus was a genuine king, though a king of a spiritual kingdom, he was given royal attributes by his persecutors in a context of mockery, hence the crown of thorns and the reed put in his hands and the, uh, uh, and the inscription over the cross, this is the king of the Jews. Okay. Well, we'll continue with some of those patterns next day then.